Here's an excerpt from a recent cannabis investing conversation. Welcome back to Investing Experts. My name is Rena Sherbel. It's great to have Jesse Redmond, cannabis analyst extraordinaire, talking cannabis stocks and investing. Any articles discussed today, you can find links to them on our show notes. And all episodes have transcripts available on Seeking Alpha. And for those wanting to follow breaking news and general news coverage of the markets, come listen with us at Wall Street Breakfast. We have Morning episodes released before 7 a.m. Eastern and afternoon episodes released around 12 noon Eastern. You've got Wall Street Breakfast and Wall Street Lunch for all your market news needs. I think it's okay to be bullish right now, and I think it's okay to also just be cautiously optimistic. You know, we've been through a lot of pain. You know, Rena, I started my investment career uh, right around 1997, and I was at Fisher Investments during the NASDAQ bear market. And that bear market felt felt like it never was going to end, and it was 929 days. Guess what? The MSOS drawdown lasted 931 days. And so there's some quote about history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And so even having gone through that NASDAQ experience in that painful bear market, I was also managing a hedge fund during the great financial crisis in 2008. So I've been through some pain before. But the duration, the 931 days, and the magnitude of the drawdown, 92%, was a really tough thing to deal with. But on the other side of that, there's all, there's uh, there's typically a lot of opportunity. Typically, when things have gone down a lot, there's a lot of opportunity on the other side. And I think that could be especially true here because things are actually, you know, I shouldn't say that, there's evidence that things may be significantly changing. Like before we were getting excited about safe banking, which I still think is important, but this move to schedule three is by far and away the single biggest thing that could happen to the cannabis industry because we get rid of 280E. And I think if you combine, you know, we think about cannabis being a state-led growth story with a series of hard to time political catalysts. That's always been our thesis on it. And I think we're starting to see those two pieces come to come together, where I think the fundamentals are improving, there's some opportunity for new states to open. And if you pair that with the potential for one, possibly even two political catalysts, I think there's a lot of, could be a lot of opportunity in the space moving forward. Okay. So what, what companies, you mentioned kind of the broad strokes of what you're focused on or what investors should be focused on. What exactly does that look like? And I'm also interested in what metrics you're, you, you're using. Yeah, so I think the kind of companies you want to own probably depends on your risk appetite, number one, your time frame, number two, and number three is how quickly do you think these political catalysts are going to happen? So if you look off of the bottom, Brina, so or since since August 30th, the biggest so if you look at MSOS, and this is on September 12th, so this could change, you know, will change by the time the episode comes out. You have MSOS up about 70%. You have air. Which which was you know which was having a really tough year up two hundred thirty percent. You have Columbia Care up one hundred ninety percent, and then you have Canopy Growth up three hundred percent. So if you are a more speculative trader, I always focus on those things that have gone down the most, those things that have a lot of short interest. And those things that will benefit most from removing 280E. So businesses that really need that additional cash flow, businesses that might have a higher debt load that are looking to do some refinancing. And again, Columbia Care was really heavily shorted into this uh, rally. And I think that's the reason it's gone up a lot. I built something, Rena, um, called the Cannabis Cash Flow Portfolio. And what that does is it takes the eight operators that in 2022 had tax adjusted operational cash flow. And so that means cash flow from operations, then accounting for if they were paying their taxes. And I built that as kind of a proxy for quality to see how that was doing this year against uh, MSOS. You know, we lack proper benchmarks in the cannabis industry. So MSOS is an ETF, but it's also, you know, often used as a proxy or a benchmark. And so coming into this event, coming into August 30th, the cannabis cash flow portfolio was outperforming MSOS by 20%. 
And so these were generally a little bit smaller companies, but you had GTI there, you had Merimed, you also had smaller companies like Grown Rogue, C21. There were eight different names in there, but this higher quality cash flow portfolio was outperforming during the downturn. And that's fairly common. You know, proceed, you know, stocks perceived as higher quality tend to do better and hold up, you know, hold hold up better in a bear market. However, this has you know completely shifted since the bounce. And over this last two weeks now, it has underperformed by 32%. And so this is common, you know, not just within cannabis, but across, you know, different sectors. And even, you know, uh, looking at that NASDAQ bear market that ended in the early 2000s, it was a smaller, more beat up names that bounced most off of the bottom. So here we are in a year where what worked for most of the year reversed and the factors that mattered, you know, are completely different. And so I think, my, what I would be inclined to do, Rena, is still focus on the, the higher quality names. You know, examples of those are, you know, someone like Green Thumb Industries, I think, continues to be the class of the cannabis sector. Merimed, which is a name we cover, I think is excellent as well. Strong balance sheet, excellent revenue growth, seasoned management team. And so I think long term, I would focus on those higher quality names that aren't as reliant on debt markets that have leverage into new states that are opening. However, if you are a more speculative trader, there still could be opportunities in the names like your heirs and your Columbia cares, which wore down so much coming into this. One thing I would caution investors about is owning Canadian stocks. And that's not to say there aren't quality Canadian names. There absolutely are. But if you think about what 280E removal means, that applies to U.S. plant touching operators. So while you may see these other businesses benefit, and ancillary companies fall a bit into that category as well. I think it's the ones on the OTC, the ones that are plant touching, the ones that could potentially uplist down the road as well, that have the most leverage to this type of to, to this type of move. And so we've, you know, ancillaries haven't participated as much in this rally. And I think that makes sense. You know, they're not subject to this 280E. They could benefit because the people that generally use their services are these plant touching operators. And as their businesses get healthier, they will have more money to spend on these ancillary services. So I'm not bearish on ancillaries. I'm not even bearish on Canada. And I'm not against diversifying a portion of your portfolio into those types of things. But I would I would put the emphasis on high quality U.S. plant touching operators. Do you feel like M&A is going to keep, uh, not keep, is, is going to pick up? A, with this news, maybe if some catalysts develop, what are your thoughts on M&A kind of going into this new year? Yeah, I think we will see more m and I think maybe some smaller operators getting acquired yeah. by larger operators. Um, when you look at the larger operators, the challenge uh, challenges the overlapping assets. And so most states have a cap on the number of stores uh, that, that, that one operator can own. So in New Jersey, that's just three. In Maryland, it's four. Um, in Illinois, it's 10, which gives you a little more flexibility. But let's say you have two operators that both have three stores in New Jersey and they want to merge or, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or do an acquisition, they need to figure out what, who they're going to sell those other three stores to. Now, in New Jersey, that may not be as hard of a market to, um, you know, to, 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 to sell assets just because it's been so profitable. But um, you know, there's, there are real challenges in divesting those overlapping assets. And so I've always thought that you know, True Leave and Ascend have pretty complementary businesses. There's not a ton of overlapping assets there. Ascend's not in, you know, uh, Florida or Arizona, and True Leaf, you know, doesn't have New Jersey, which is big um, for Ascend. And so I think that you know, th those types of businesses, I think there are some opportunities to fit those puzzle pieces together. But I think in order to do so, you kind of need to look at look at a map of the states and figure out which ones could fit together. And then also say what happens with the management teams. For example, if you were to have uh, ascend and true leave merge. You know, uh, I don't think Kim is looking to retire. I think she's probably looking to lead a business. So you, you would need a structure where those two management teams could fit together. So I think that with the bigger operators, there's more challenges on a couple of levels to getting those sorts of things done. But I wouldn't be surprised to see smaller businesses get acquired by larger ones. You know, we, it's not a great example, but last week we did see the acquisition of uh, Vitacan by Planet Thir by Planet Thirteen to build out their. Uh, Florida footprint. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see more of those things. 
do you still feel like it's a possibility truly of acquiring Ascend? I mean, I guess maybe you do, it sounds like. Because I was asking Ascend's, uh, you know, interim CEO a few months ago about it. It's been, you've been talking about it for a while. It's been talked about for a while. And I wonder with, uh, you know, the acquisition of Harvest, uh, which, you know, who knows how to judge that exactly at this point, but certainly not an easy uh, process. Uh, do, do you think that that's still a possibility? I think it's a possibi uh, possibility. I wouldn't really assign a high probability to it. Um, okay. And I don't have any unique information around that. I just think in terms of when you think about those couple of factors about little overlapping right. assets and the potential um, for one management team to lead and the other one to be integrated, I think those fit together potentially a bit more with Ascend, although they just did, mm -hmm. they just, especially when they didn't have a CEO, right? When, you know, Abner you know, moved to executive chairman, they were in a CEO search for was it around nine months maybe and they do have a great new ceo so maybe the probability of that has has gone down even further so i'm not pounding the table bullish on that i just think if you look at the top 10 those are a couple of pieces that do fit together but i wouldn't give that a real high probability and ascend is uh you know that stock is you know is, is one of the ones that's you know more than doubled over this past couple of weeks it was way oversold for a while there so that's a name that i've been uh, forever too bullish on i've liked that name for a long time it doesn't get a lot of love it doesn't get a lot of attention, but I think with the footprint they have and some of the changes they're making, I do like that name. And what about True Leave? Uh, people are talking about its reliance on Florida and it's going to come to bite them and what's happening with Harvest. And what are your thoughts on True Leave? So I think they're in a you know a tougher period where if you just look at their footprint, um, competition is fierce in Florida. You know, Florida, as I'm sure most of our listeners know, is a medical-only market. It requires being vertically integrated. There are a limited number of operators there, but there are a lot of stores. And so your heirs, uh, your True Leaves, your you know, Veranos, et cetera, have 50, 60, 70, 80 stores in Florida. So there are a lot of stores, and what that leads to is a lot of price competition. And we've seen that uh, we, we, we've seen that in terms of uh, basket sizes going down, constant promotions in Florida, lower you know, margins coming down in a lot of cases. And so I think Florida is still a good market and it, as long as it's medical, but I think the real massive opportunity is one that potentially flips rec. Arizona is a different state, um, similar challenges in terms of price comp compression, but for different reasons. I don't know if you know this, uh, Rena, but Arizona doesn't have seed to sale tracking. And so that means you can grow a bunch of weed in uh, Oklahoma and bring it to Arizona and find creative ways to fit that into the system. And so that's led to a massive oversupply in Arizona and prices dropped about 50% over 12 months. And so I think that acquisition of Harvest, you know, in you know, hindsight's 2020, but I think in hindsight, that probably wasn't great timing and they overpaid for that. Um, so I think truly is in a couple, you know, their, their core markets today, and those are change will change a little bit as new states turn on. But I think that their core markets today with Florida and Arizona are in a bit of transition periods. But no one is more levered to the potential shift to adult use in Florida than True Leave. I mentioned that Florida has about 22 million people, and that's one of the states that's been growing in terms of the population. But it also gets 120 million tourists every year. With the medical system, those tourists can't buy cannabis. But if they flip to adult use, anyone over 21, that's a snowbird you know, coming down from where we're from, um, Rena, in the Midwest. I know lots of people from Minnesota that go down there. But also the spring breakers, if you're over 21, they could buy cannabis. And the cruise ships is another interesting one. Um, Sunburn has a great location. I think they acquired it from Bedman in Key West. And when you walk off where the cru cruise ships dock there, one of the first things you see is that store. And so I think Arizona, I think uh, rather Florida is a super exciting market. The question is, when does that potentially turn to adult use? And is a, you know, possibly we see that on the ballot in uh, 2024. And if that were to get on the ballot and ultimately pass, that would you know, be a massive catalyst for True Leave. And True Leave's been one of the more beat up names coming into this that had, that had gotten fairly cheap. And so I think to have a perspective, you know, if you're thinking about taking a hard look at True Leave, I would look at what the valuation is there. And then I would look at what's your perspective on those core markets. And particularly, what do you think are the, are the probabilities that uh, adult use gets on the ballot in 24 in Florida and ultimately passes? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned MSOS as an ETF and as a, as a you know, proxy index. Um, 
what are your thoughts about the ETF space? There's a lot of negativity around MSOS and how they're set up and how they're set up to continue. Uh, and in general, the surrounding ETFs, a lot of complaints around their very existence, some not existing any, uh, uh, not, not in existence anymore. What are your thoughts about the ETF space in cannabis? Yeah, I feel like that's a lot of that angst and complaining is really misguided. Uh, you know, MSOS is a great proxy for U.S. cannabis. And if you can't buy the individual names and you need something that's NYSE listed, which is true for a lot of investors, if you can't access things that are on the OTC, you may not be able to get them in your brokerage firm. You may have custody issues with those types of names and you want exposure to U.S. cannabis. I think MSOS is a perfectly fine way to do that. It's going to be more expensive because they do use swaps and swaps have financing costs. And so it's a more expensive way to get access. It does have a management fee. I think it's right around 75 basis points all in. So if there's an additional cost there in terms of doing that versus owning the underlying. But in my opinion, it gives you fairly good exposure to U.S. cannabis. I don't think it's super clever. You know, you don't see active man, real, you know, active management moving around. It is actively managed, but you don't see short-term trading there. You don't see market timing. Um, you know, they definitely have made a few mistakes. Um, you know, along the way, you know, there's names that they've owned too much of. Um, there's names maybe in hindsight they shouldn't have, you know, owned. Period. You know, the parent company is one that stands out there. But we've all made mistakes along the way. Um, Not me. Yeah, I never. You know, you you, you, Just would, you, you would never. You would never own the parent company. I would, would never you? own the parent company. No. no. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So, but and there's names. Awkward that, laughter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's names uh, that they don't own. Like it's super interesting. They don't own a cent. You know, that's the only. You know, I think top twenty-ish name that they don't own, and certainly the only top. You know, top ten name that they don't own. So, you know, I think we could have different opinions on how we might, you know, go about running an ETF like MSOS. But if you want exposure to U.S. cannabis, I don't think that's a terrible way to go. And I don't fully understand all the complaining around that. There are other options. Uh, you know, our friends at Poseidon, you know, did close down PSDN, and that was uh, my favorite cannabis uh, ETF. So that's not available anymore. You do have Tim Seymour, who I think is a bright player in the space with CNBS. If you want global exposure through advisor shares. You have uh, YOLO. Um, you know, there's there's the you know Weed has good exposure to the top five names, so that's another credible option. So there's a bunch of different ones, uh, d d different ones out there. Um, I would I would probably start by deciding: Do you want exposure to global, or do you want exposure to U.S. only? If you want exposure to U.S. only, then uh, MSOS or the ticker you know Weed are probably good ways to do that. If you want to get some Canadian exposure, um, some more global names in that kind of portfolio then maybe a CNBS or a YOLO would be a better fit. But I think part of the complaining arena is that when a space is down 90%, uh, you know, who's going to, you know, who's going to get super excited about the ETFs in the space. And so I feel like there may be a little bit of collateral damage for what's gone on more broadly. And I guess my closing thoughts, Rena, would be just going back to where we started, where cannabis is a state-led growth story with a series of hard-to-time political catalysts. And we went through a really hard period. And I think for valid reasons, we went through a hard period. Prices were coming down. We didn't have a lot of new states opening. And we were seeing zero political progress. And that led to 931 days of pain and a 92% drawdown. And I think there's reasons to be cautiously optimistic. It feels like things are starting to improve. Going back to the beginning with Morgan Paxia saying, it's okay to be bullish. I agree with those sentiments and I'm excited to see what, what takes place in the second half of the year. Absolutely. Amen. Here's to, here's to better news. And uh, anybody wanting to know more about cannabis investing, definitely search Jesse out either on Water Tower Research or on Twitter. You won't regret it. He's got some great analysis. Really appreciate you, Jesse. Thanks for coming on. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Raina. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Just a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast should not be considered investment advice. This is for entertainment purposes only, and you should seek advice from a licensed professional before investing. If you enjoyed the episode, leave a rating or review on your favorite podcasting app, and we'll see you soon with a new episode.